Okay, I gotta ask you, where are you on shows that make you cringe? I'm asking because Nathan Fielder's newest show, The Curse, made me cringe so hard I wanted to die. The Curse just ended its first season. Today on the podcast, was it searing satire or did it just make you mad? I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, in case you haven't seen it, The Curse follows Whitney and Asher, their young white couple. They're played by Emma Stone and Nathan Fielder. And what they're doing is they're filming an HGTV show about their, quote, ethical attempts to gentrify a New Mexico neighborhood. The homes they're building are environmentally friendly. They're assuring the mostly non-white community that the neighbors they bring in, they're going to have definitely non-racist liberal values. And they're employing local residents by leasing commercial spaces for free. They're calling their show Fliplanthropy, which is a bananas word to say out loud. Basically, Whitney and Asher are trying to make the trying to be basically the white saviors of Española and make a lot of money from it. I want you to hear the scene from the second episode where they talk about how to film the show, quote unquote, the right way. We're asking Kara to do this as sort of a volunteer thing, right? Because Dougie says there's not going to be money in the budget for a cultural consultant. Promise we were going to do this. No, right. yes, I'm just saying I'm in this world. I know so many natives. I could ask Mike or Florence or Elaine we're not to be a part. one of your casino buddies to speak to the entirety of the native experience. How are they any different than Kara? We are friends with someone who's part of our community and who happens to be native, but who I believe is about to be one of the biggest names in contemporary art. That's whose validation I need. Oof. A couple of folks are here to look back on the first season of The Curse. And that truly wild finale, we're going to talk about all of it. Phelan Johnson, Emil Niazi, welcome to the podcast, y'all. How's it going? Good. I'm happy hey, that, good. I'm, I'm happy that you're here. I'm stressed out in terms of talking about this, but let's do it. Okay, for people who are not familiar with Nathan Fielder, he's a Canadian comedian. He's known for making comedy that is absurd, satirical, incredibly uncomfortable. That's the brand. The Curse is supposed to be the send-up of a lot of things, of white liberal guilt, of HGTV couples and reality television, and also the modern art world. Phelan, as absurd as it was, what what elements of the show felt true to life for you? Um, I think white people being uncomfortable. <laughs> um, <laughs> like that felt very true to me as an indigenous person. You know, I, I was I was thinking about like there's one particular story that always comes to mind when I think about um, white people being uncomfortable with me. And I did a talk in upstate New York years ago and. Um, it was all about theater and art and writing. And afterwards we opened it up to the floor to do a Q and A. And, um, there was an older man in the front row who raised his hand right away and said to me, um, yeah, so I just have a question for you. Um, the Buffalo Bills cannot win a title and it's because their stadium is built on a burial ground. What do I do about that? And like, to me, that felt like very curse writing adjacent. I was like, I was like, these things do happen. So some of that dialogue and some of those scenarios that seemed like super cringe and outlandish didn't really land as that cringe for me because I've experienced it firsthand. Yeah. Wow. Where someone said, hey, what can we do about the curse that is on the Buffalo Bills? Yeah, that's that's wild. Uh, Mila, what about you? What left an impression in terms of elements that felt like, yeah, that's really real life there? Um. Yeah, I, I feel bad for the Buffalo Bills, though, for real. They do have a curse. Um, <laughs> Listen, I, let's not put that out there right now. Things are tense. Things are tense in Bills country. <laughs> um, I agree with Phelan that, that white guilt, white discomfort was, you know, such a key part of this show. And I mm. think it really resonated through Emma Stone's character and her incredible portrayal of Whitney, this, like, very... You know, you heard it in the clip that you played. She's like literally said, that's the validation I need. Mm-hmm. That there are specific, there's a hierarchy of minority and a hierarchy of approval that as a white woman, she can she can receive that will position her in this world um, and allow her to see herself um, in a specific type of way right. and let others see her in a specific type of way. And I think the curse is very much about... Um, 
how we want to be perceived versus who we actually are. Mm -hmm. And I think it's summed up very well in that character and in Emma Stone's portrayal of that character. Can we just say Emma Stone doing the best acting of her career at the she moment? She is so, so brilliant. On another and I, level. You just so feel good. like having so good. pour things out and the curse at the same time. You just like, wow, the range. The I mean, range. at the Golden Globes, yeah. like she was nominated for both television um, and film because of the curse and Poor Things, and everybody's sort of talking about her performance in Poor Things as, you know, one of the most standout performances of recent years. But so. then she kind of ends up making that Whitney face the whole time, right? Where she's like, "Me, <laughs> I'm not that good," and you're like, "Okay, Emma Stone, <laughs> please just own it, Emma just Stone. Own it, yeah, we we accept you. You should accept yourself." Uh, Phil, and you said you were hot and cold on the series. What what did it? You know, where did it lose you? Well, I feel like anytime there's Indigenous characters on the screen, I immediately, there is a bit of tension that exists within me. I want to believe that, you know, Hollywood um, and film and television can tell stories with Indigenous characters well, mm. especially when the team is not led by Indigenous storytellers. Um, and so I was a little bit nervous about it. And, you know, I do feel like while some characters did eventually develop a little bit more, there were some that I just wanted a little bit more from. <laughs> Oh, my my dog agrees. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, it felt like, well, some characters did have more of an arc. I wanted a little bit more from others. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what about you, Emil? Was there anything that didn't land for you? Well, I think, you know, it, it wanted to touch on so many very interesting, nuanced, and timely subjects, gentrification, uh, white guilt, you know, race relations, um, it's really an ambitious show. Philanthropy yeah. Yeah. All, and, and HGTV and the couples that populate it. Like, it, you know, there's so much to get at and to say about these topics. But it felt like to me uh, an exercise in in having that laugh, but then it not landing. Mm. So it, I, to me, it's like there was a lot they wanted to say and a lot they wanted to talk about, but it it never felt like it quite resolved in the way that you wanted it to like maybe if they just honed in on one thing yeah might have felt like you had a bit more payoff but i just felt like there was a lot they wanted to get at and it never just hit it well this is this is now where we talk about payoff because now we're going to talk about the finale okay yeah. Uh, we have to spoil the finale a little bit. We have no choice. I'm sorry to do this, but the, the, the episode starts with an interview on the Rachel Ray show. Whitney's pregnant. You know, she and Asher are smiling on the big screen behind Rachel. The, the smile they have is a little bit terrifying, but that's fine. They're plugging their show. It's now called Green Queen. But Rachel doesn't seem all that interested in the couple. Asher and Whitney talk about it in front of the camera woman afterwards. Let's listen to that. Do you think Rachel actually watched the show or she was just briefed on it? I'm sure she watched it. Do you know? Do you know if Rachel actually watched our show? Uh, I know Rachel's very busy, so if she didn't, it wouldn't be personal. Can I get your mic pack? Yes. I'm going to take your microphone off now. Do I have permission to touch you again? It's permission granted. Hey, watch it, pal. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's interesting that she didn't bring up the baby. I know, I teed her up. You see, you did good. You did better. Emil, I honestly, every time I hear that, I just want to I want to die. What stood out for you about it? Oh, my. What didn't stand out? Like <laughs> this scene, this opening is a perfect encapsulation of of the show. Hmm. You know, you have um, Rachel Ray playing herself, but this like parody, I mean, you know. She is a parody. Like, yeah. her whole shtick is being this den mother, but she's sexy and she's flirty. And so seeing her kind of play up that the grotesquerie of that with, <laughs> yes. you know, the guy from The Sopranos and they're cooking and she's flirting with him and she's talking about wine and her husband and her back is to this couple and they're just frozen in this, like, hideous smile, this, like, rictus grin. <laughs> Uh, but but also I was so impressed with that too because it would be hard for me as a human being to sit there and like be so ignored by this host that again I so desperately want approval from. Yes. Uh, and then you know she Rachel Ray plugs her like compostable wipes 
and you see Whitney sort of thrown under the bus over and over again about her homes and their sustainability. And yeah. and then there's this moment where Rachel Ray says, well, you know, we can't all build homes, new homes from scratch. So what can we do? And it's a great moment for Whitney to to really prove that she stands behind the beliefs that she espouses. Yeah. And all the best you can come up with is take shorter showers. And you're just like, <laughs> it's a, a, a bursting of the bubble immediately. Like you just, yeah. it's all so phony and it's just like perfectly summed up by the interplay between this couple and Rachel and all of them and the viewer and this, and this, you know, yeah. fourth, the f- wall here. Um, so I love that scene. And I just thought, wow, well, like immediately this episode is going to be incredible. But, Phelan, I'm going to keep spoiling things, okay? We're going to talk about how this episode ends. Uh, it's the day after the Rachel Ray taping. Asher wakes up, and he's literally on the ceiling. He's literally floating above the bed, no longer beholden to gravity. Whitney goes into labor, you know, and she needs to be driven to the hospital by her doula. But Asher ends up flying into a tree because, again, he's flying into – he can't – Gravity doesn't apply to him anymore. He's trying to cling to anything for dear life. He clings to a tree, and then he flies off literally into space. There are a million theories about what this represents. Phelan, would you like to take a shot at it? I think he flies to space to meet Elon Musk. Um, no, I don't. Like, I have I have no idea. You know, like, I have no idea. And, you know, I've looked on the internet, and I've seen the millions of theories that exist out there. Um, and the various opinions and some people love it and some people hate it, but it honestly, I've never felt more comfortable in not knowing and also just like kind of not caring. Like I'm like, it almost feels like the point of this whole thing is like, it reminds me of the, the, the Nathan for you episode where Nathan Fielder develops an anecdote to tell in a late night show and he goes on Jimmy Kimmel and he has this elaborate fake story about a lost luggage and a oversized suit he has to wear and like potential drugs found in the suit and he gets pulled over yeah and the story is all fake yeah and so part of me feels like this this feels almost similar to that where I'm just like I think the joke's on us in a way and so part of me is like okay I watched it all yep. <laughs> Emil, about 40 seconds to you, pal. What do you, what do you make of the setting to space? I mean, I actually really liked the ending because I think you the, like the, the whole show to me is about the karmic ledger and what you put in versus what you take out, right? Yeah. So they, they are trying so hard to give to this community, and yet what they take from it is so much greater. And they're this toxic presence. And in order for Whitney to feel like she can have a fresh start... Uh, Asher literally has to disappear. He has to go into space and be, you know, die so that, but in a way he dies so that he can be reborn. And ultimately life is the curse (laughs) because this, you know, this baby will not be a fresh start. It is cursed to live with Whitney and and to continue this same uh, toxicity that has been granted by generations of, of this. So to me, it's like a karmic ledger sort of thing. One must go so one can come, but uh, the, the loop that they're trapped in will never change. I, listen, I grab the ending and I grant that uh, that reading of it, but also the device that they use of a man who wakes up and he's literally like about to be well, I'm sucked doing out this dis- from the ceiling. <laughs> no one can see that, but I'm on the ceiling right now. A perfect place, <laughs> a perfect place to leave it. Emil Diazzi, Phelan Johnson, thank you, so much, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being here, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Emil Niazi is a columnist at The Cut. She's based in Toronto. And Phelan Johnson is the host of the CBC podcast Secret Life of Canada, which starts its sixth season next month. We caught up with her in Montreal. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and this is Commotion. Listen, a part of my job is keeping up with the latest in pop culture, and even I find that a little, a little bit intimidating. I mean, you got to admit, there is a lot of stuff going on, going on. So I felt really bad for the contestants on Jeopardy when this clue came up recently. New Jazz for 1200. Jazz trumpeter Keon Harold can be heard on Stay by this late rapper seen here. Who is Mac Miller? Okay, I get it. A lot of viewers couldn't believe the contestants didn't know the answer, and I couldn't either because they were showing a photo of Mac Miller, and they had no idea who that was. 
And I guess in my universe, the young rapper was a big deal, and a lot of people were affected by his death in 2018. But to me, this is also a sign of just how hard it is to know everything going on in pop culture right now. It is impossible to stream all the shows, to listen to every album drop, that binge every podcast, I don't know, know what's going on with the Vanderpump rules, you know, and who swept the Emmys, etc. So we called up the only person that I wanted to talk to about this, Matea Roach. They're a 23-time Jeopardy winner, and they competed in the Tournament of Champions last year. I started by asking them what went through their head when they saw the contestants completely blank on that Mac Miller clue. I think that having been on the show, I, my prevailing emotion is always just empathy for the contestants, especially <laughs> when it's something like this that you can kind of sense as you're watching it is going to go viral. Yeah. Um, I guess just to explain like what might have happened. I mean, first of all, as you said, like pop culture is so fragmented. It's possible that just none of them have, had heard of Mac Miller. Yeah. But there's a few things. I think one is like you can know who Mac Miller is and not recognize him by his photo. Right. And the clue as it was written mm. was really heavily reliant, I think, on you see the photo of Mac Miller and you're like, I've seen that guy before. I know who that is. Um, Stay, the song that was referenced in the clue is a really popular song title. Lots of artists have songs by that title. It's not the first song that I think of when I hear of Mac Miller. Yeah, so fair. I can see how people might be like, stay Rihanna yeah. and know that that's wrong and just don't want to buzz in and say anything at all. The other thing with Jeopardy specifically that home viewers don't realize um, is that when you see a clue that has like an image, yeah. Uh, it blows up to fill your whole TV screen. It's like the only thing that you can see. But for contestants, uh, it's one of just like a lot of things that you see. Uh, the images and videos show up in completely a different part of the studio on a different monitor than the written text of the clue. And so you have to totally shift focus when there's a photo clue like that to like look somewhere else. Uh, it's kind of far away. It's not blown up to the same proportions that you get at home. Yeah. So I'm always just like, uh, I want to cut these people some slack. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. I, I guess like it's really easy for me to be sitting at home going, don't you know who Mac Miller is? But I, there's a lot of things. You're right. There's a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. I should extend them a bit more grace. Have you have what, what about you? Have you ever kicked yourself for not getting a pop culture clue? Yeah. Well, I'll say, first of all, part of the fun of the show is to be able to be like, oh, my God, how do these three smart people not know this? And I know that I should be on that show. Right. Like that's part of what makes it work. And part of what I think inspires a lot of people uh, to audition who then go on and sometimes do quite well. Yeah. But yeah, totally. Like I've been on the show and there's been stuff that I like I once there was a picture clue where there was a photo of Nat King Cole and I like just couldn't recognize who Nat King Cole was because yeah. of course I know him, but I don't know him like by his face. Yeah, sure. Um. There was another time where there was a clue that was something about like a female star who'd won an Emmy in the 90s and it gave the nickname the Divine Miss M, which is Bette Midler. Um, but the other thing, too, is like a lot of Jeopardy is being able to think quickly. Um, that's yeah. something that maybe I could have come to in like 10, 15 seconds. But within the five seconds that you get, I was like divine m crazy nicknames like that's mariah carey <laughs> <laughs> and people online were like this young person man kids these days don't know anything no respect on bet midler's name that what i like about this is like that's the bucket that they reach for that these you know these people don't know anything because they don't know that clue when in reality you've been on jeopardy the whole point is you actually do know a lot like the reaction that the the, the, the contestants got online from not recognizing mac miller's photo was all this disbelief and kind of like harsh insults some people called them um uncultured swine but like it doesn't cut the other way. You know what I mean? Like people don't get as worked up when you're like, you don't know the thing about the Visigoths. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's only, it's only unidirectional. So what do you think it is about pop culture that gets people so upset? Well, I, I think it's about the level of accessibility, right? There's a perception mm. that like the average person on the street should know something about pop culture. Um, sports is the other category where this happens a lot, where often because a lot of Jeopardy contestants are like stereotypically nerds who don't like sports. Yeah, they know about the Visigoths, clues, but not sports. They, exactly. Yeah. They know, you know, they know like wars, battles, uh, science, like all the periodic table elements, but not necessarily like NFL football. Sure. Um, but, you know, these are the areas that the average person watching the show is maybe the most passionate and the most knowledgeable about, right? So the gap of sort of the superiority complex that you can have as an average viewer is kind of bigger. I think that that's why, right? It's like, it's the area where there's the most sense of, oh my God, I know that. How do these three people not know that? And it's just like fun to dunk on people, right? Like, I think everyone yeah. likes to do a little 
social media dunk every now and again. And sometimes Jeopardy contestants end up on the receiving end of that. Well, allow me to introduce you to a moment where I was like, oh, I can do some dunking. This happened on Celebrity Jeopardy last month. Also a Taylor Swift song for 200. Careful, this washing machine cycle using cold water and low spin speed is suggested for lingerie and silk neckties. Kira. What is gentle? No. Mo or Amanda? The song here is called Delicate. The, the, Taylor Swift does not have a song called Gentle, Kira Sedgwick. It's fine. Uh, how could she not know? He's like, that's always my reaction. He's like, how could she possibly not know? But then I have to like catch myself and go, does everyone need to know as much about Taylor Swift as I do? Is I, 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 I guess the point is to check myself a little bit, Mateo. Mm-hmm. See, my response to that is actually like, damn, these celebrities aren't doing their own laundry. (laughs) (laughs) They don't know that delicate is the washing machine cycle. uh, You're right. That is quite revelatory. Uh, Let's talk about preparing for Jeopardy. How do you prepare for Jeopardy? What was your strategy in terms of keeping on top of stuff? So I, um, I think for me, like my strategy when I first was on the show was I only had really three weeks to prepare. And so I didn't do much in the way of like deep dive studying of any particular subject area. I was doing a lot of like looking at old games, uh, getting a feel for those clues that the writers put in, like with the Taylor Swift song, also referencing the washing machine cycle as like an alternate route in. Those are the things that you want to be able to pick up on quickly. um, So that even if you maybe don't know the exhaustive catalog of all of Taylor Swift songs, you might still have a chance getting in some other way. Right. When I was returning to the show for Tournament of Champions and Masters, I had more time to prepare. And so that was when I started to look at like, what are some of my weak areas? Um, And one of them for me is sort of pop culture that's just like not genres or time periods that I'm familiar with. So um, old TV sometimes will come up, right? Like I don't necessarily know what the most popular TV shows of the 60s and 70s were uh, or the names of characters on MASH because like I wasn't there watching it, right? But that's something that's (laughs) That's fair fair. play uh, for them to ask about. Same like country music, right? I'm not a big country music listener. Can't relate, but but I understand. Yeah, it's like a huge, huge genre of music that tons of people listen to. So from like a trivia perspective, that's equally as important as like the music that I personally enjoy. So some people will look at like best of lists, like, you know, things that have been the top rated, like Nielsen, whatever, uh, who's won awards. Like some people I, I know who don't listen to a lot of current pop music, but our repeat contestants on Jeopardy will do things like read the billboard charts to sort of stay abreast of what's going on. And then mm. that way they're not feeling like, oh, I literally need to go listen to all this music in order to know what's going on. I can just kind of skim and then listen to the stuff that I enjoy specifically. Uh, Listen, on that note, how about we end with a recommendation? Something that you're reading or watching or listening to that you're like, you know what? I'm having a good time with this. People should know about it. Yeah, so I'll give two. One is like a current thing that you can probably still go see in theaters. Uh, One is something that I watch that's older. The first is Anatomy of a Fall is like the award season movie that I have seen that I feel like the most strongly about. I thought it was so good. Um, Mm. The remix of Pimp that they use in the movie has been stuck in my head for like weeks. It's a French movie. Um, I haven't seen Anatomy of a Fall yet, but it's a French movie. Yeah, so it's a French movie. Um, It follows a court proceeding basically where there's an ambiguity around um, how this woman's husband has died, whether it was accidental, whether she killed him. Yeah. Um, French court is wild. It's like real housewives in there. Um, just <laughs> really entertaining, but also just deeply moving at parts. Uh, the older thing that I watched was a two part German movie from 1973 world on a wire directed by Reiner Werner Fassbinder. It's like the matrix. If it was made 25 years before the matrix came out Ooh. and was in West Germany. That sounds fantastic. So sick. It is so amazing. Uh, it's on, maybe you can get it through your library. I watched it on Criterion channel. Um, if you like sci-fi and that sort of like head trippy, you know, there's a noir vibe to it. I would really recommend World on a Wire. Mateo Roach, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for your time, friend. Always fun to chat. Thanks so much for having me. Mateo Roach is a Jeopardy super champion and the host of the Backbench podcast on Canada Land. And that is it for the podcast today. Remember, you can listen to any episode of Commotion anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Alamin Abdul Mahmoud. I'm going to be here tomorrow. If you're going to be here, let's dance. <laughs> <laughs>